positive, feel good radio. This is E Radio. It's time to enter the life changing and ever evolving world of ophthalmology. We chat to Dr. Dylan Joseph. Welcome to Medical Monday. How's it going, Doctor? Hey, Jan, uh, thanks again. Great to be back on the show. You had a busy surgical day today and uh, keen to uh, discuss a few uh, basics of ophthalmology, a couple of basic optical concepts which helps people understand um, you know, why mm. we do laser vision correction and cataract surgery. Now, today we're starting with a few terms. Let's start off with myopia. That's also when you are short-sighted. 100% correct. Uh, so myopia essentially means that you can see um, very close and your distance vision is poor. Uh, And that can be corrected with uh, contact lenses, spectacles, uh, up until about the age of 18. And as I said last week after that, we've got a number of surgical approaches that we can adopt. The interesting thing about myopia is that if you never do anything about myopia, depending on how short-sighted you are, you will have a permanent pair of reading glasses built into your visual system for when you hit your 40s. So mm. you will unlikely um, have the need for a pair of reading glasses over 40 years old with myopia. And now, okay, that's myopia. Now we move on to mm-hmm. hyperopia. Hyperopia is, is quite the opposite. Generally, the term used for that is farsightedness. So okay. people are able to see in the distance, but are unable to see up close. But actually, there's a bit of a misnomer there because hyperopia when we look at it from an optical perspective means that you can actually neither see clearly in the distance nor for near so you are actually needing correction uh, for your distance vision as well as your near vision so in hyperopia what happens with the light rays as they travel through the eye they fall at a point a fictitious point behind the eye behind the retina so you're going to need a form of correction, be it in spectacles or contact lenses or vision correction, where you actually converge the light rays, so bring them forward to a point that falls at the back of the eye correctly. That's the opposite for myopia. In myopia, they fall short of the back of the eye, so it's a virtual point in in front of the back of the eye, and then you need a divergent system, a divergent spectacle or a contact lens, which makes the rays go further apart from each other to allow them to fall at a point at the back of the eye. And we'll get into the details later on how we do this optically and by changing the visual system, by changing your cornea, by changing uh, metrics inside your eye when we're considering vision correction surgery to give you the same results. So when somebody, especially the older people, sit with their cell phones and uh, they don't Mm. have their glasses near and you see their arm just extends and and their phone Mm. is like really far away, but then they can see what's Mm. on the phone. Is that myopia or hyperopia? So that's actually presbyopia. Oh, okay. Yeah, presbyopia is a a third um, uh, basic basic optic phenomenon and, and that's something that we're going to all develop. So when we hit our 40s and 50s, say we've got perfect vision for distance and perfect vision for reading in our 20s and 30s, and we've never needed vision correction, like clockwork, like I explained last week, in your 40s, your your, your muscles around the lens and the lens itself start stiffening up, and they're unable to focus for your near, and that results in that short-arm syndrome, and we call that term presbyopia. So it's a loss of your near vision, which you used to have. Um, and so it's not the same as hyperopia, because mm. in hyperopia we can't see far or we can't see near. But in presbyopia we have been able to see well in the distance and well for near up until our 40s, until like clockwork, we start developing, as you said, that short arm syndrome. Okay, very interesting. Now the next term we're looking at is stigmatism. What is stigmatism? Yeah, so a stigmatism is where the light rays don't fall at a point in front of the uh, the back of the eye or behind the back of the eye. They actually fall at two points. So you've got a point generally in front of the eye, uh, of the retina, the back of the eye, and behind that. So, and in between, you get what's called image blur. So stigmatism comes from two structures in the eye. One, the cornea, the outer clear dome of the eye. Or, and secondly, 
the lens inside the eye. Remember, we talked about the lens becoming hard when we get cataracts mm. and changing when we get presbyopia. But those two structures in the eye can induce uh, what's called astigmatism. Now, if we look at it in very basic terms, astigmatism uh, means rugby ball shape. Mm. Okay, so when we look at it from an optical perspective, if we take a cylinder, right, a, that looks like a toilet roll, essentially, this cylinder has a power in one axis, axis, and perpendicular to that axis is the axis of that power. So most optical systems, um, it's getting a little bit complex, but have astigmatism. And astigmatism, in more simple terms, means rugby ball shape. So if you look at a rugby ball, in the one meridian, it's flat. Okay, so that's the long part of the rugby ball. And in the meridian at 90 degrees to that, it is steep. So that's exactly what astigmatism means. Now, when we look at the eye, it's not a rugby ball and it's not a soccer ball alone. It's often a combination of the two. Now, when it's a soccer ball, we talk about things like myopia or hyperopia, short-sightedness or far-sightedness, in which we can correct that with a what's called a sphere, which looks like a soccer ball. When we talk about astigmatism, that's when the eye's shape is essentially like a rugby ball. And it needs a special cylinder, which I was talking to you about earlier, to correct that. And when we look at correcting the eye's optics, we often use a combination of sphere and cylinder because not everyone only has astigmatism or only has hyperopia or myopia. Very often, people have a combination of the above. So myopic astigmatism hyperopic astigmatism or astigmatism on its own. So it's essential and very important as a clinician, as a refractive surgeon to say, okay, well, where is the astigmatism coming from? And um, do we have it in combination with short-sightedness or far-sightedness? And how are we going to put this into our treatment plan? Uh, so I hope that gives a little bit of, uh, uh, or makes it a little easier to understand um, the different concepts of uh, the basic optics uh, in the eye. Mm. Thank you for explaining uh, all those terms. Very interesting. My next question is, how can laser treat all of these conditions? Okay. So laser changes the shape of the front of the eye. It changes the, the curvature of the cornea, essentially. Remember, the cornea is that outside clear dome of the eye. And lasers remove tissue. They can't add tissue. So remember in myopia, for instance, the light rays are falling short of the back of the eye. So what do we need to do to the cornea to make the light rays fall a little bit further backwards? We need to flatten the cornea and flatten the central cornea. So if we're removing tissue in the center of the cornea, we're essentially pushing the light rays backwards to a point where they're going to come into focus at the back of the eye. And that's where testing the patient's vision is very important and putting it into refined nomograms and constantly watching your nomograms to make sure that what you're putting into your laser, it, the laser is actually doing. Mm. And it's the opposite in hyperopia or farsightedness. In hyperopia, what we're wanting to do is make the cornea steeper, almost like a mountain, so that the light rays converge through it quicker uh, or faster, so that they don't fall at a point behind the retina or the back of the eye. They now fall on the retina again. So basically, we are doing a treatment in the mid-periphery of the cornea, so not in the dead center. It looks like a donut, that treatment pattern, if I can describe it like mm. that, which then steepens the center of the cornea to make the light rays fall on uh, a place at the back. In astigmatism, it's a, it's a, it's a bit more complex how the lasers do that, uh, and possibly a bit beyond the realm of the discussion. But essentially, it's also trying to take the rugby ball shape of the eye and make it more like a soccer ball. Mm. And the beauty of the lasers is they can treat a combination of those as well. And when we discuss uh, myths uh, at a later episode, you know, one of the myths is that you, you can't, people believe you can't laser astigmatism. And you certainly can. If it's a normal astigmatism uh, and there's no problems with the eye itself, the astigmatism is not abnormal, we can laser up to what we refer as to as sixth diopters of astigmatism, which is which is a lot. Um, 
And uh, the lasers can certainly treat either one of these profiles on their own, it can treat a combination of them, and it can treat presbyopia, which is loss of your reading vision. And even if you have myopia, hyperopia, astigmatism, and presbyopia, and or presbyopia, so one of the above with presbyopia, it can treat those, uh, those uh, combinations. So we can show you that face-to-face, -face, show you the actual vis visual simulation, we can put you into contact lens trials as well to simulate what laser vision correction can do in treating those different optical problems so that we make sure that you're going to be uh, as happy with the visual outcomes we can get you. Now, Dr. Dylan, can other forms of uh, lens-based uh, surgery also treat this? Absolutely. So when we look at vision correction um, and say the patient's not a laser vision correction candidate, but they still have short-sightedness, far-sightedness, astigmatism, or presbyopia, so loss, loss of their near vision, uh, generally in their, in their 40s and 50s, we can consider removing the human lens in what we refer to as a customized lens exchange, and we can use special types of technologies, which we'll talk about in another episode, being trifocal lenses to give you reading, computer, and distance. We've got lenses that give you blended vision, uh, which is another topic on its own, um, and we can treat astigmatism with very special lenses called toric lenses. Now, say, for example, I uh, told you astigmatism means the overall shape of the eye is like a rugby ball, okay? We have special lenses that essentially have a rugby ball shape built into them to offset the rugby ball shape of the eye. So when you, you have one minus one equals zero. So one on the cornea, one on the lens, you align them up, you're going to get zero astigmatism left over. And, and that's the uh, advances in the lens technologies that are so incredible um, that, are, that are allowing us to treat these uh, various forms of uh, refractive errors. Dr. Joseph, uh, can these problems be uh, treated when uh, doing cataract surgery as well? And how can we do it? Yeah, excellent question. So when we're doing cataract surgery, we're uh, removing the lens. Um, of the eyes. So remember that lens has become cloudy, it's become yellow or brown and uh, whether we're doing it for a customized lens exchange procedure that I've just talked about a minute ago or cataract surgery, that procedure remains the same. The technicalities remain identical. The choice of lenses that we have to use remain identical. So whether the patient is 40, 50, 60, 70 or 80, and now in their 70s, 80s, 60s, they're developing cataracts. We can still use that same approach with the same lens technology um, to correct their vision for myopia, hyperopia, astigmatism, presbyopia, or a combination of the above. So absolutely, we've got, we've got options. Dr. Joseph, uh, what ages can we consider surgery from, uh, specifically laser vision correction? Uh, laser vision correction surgery is generally looked at from the age of 18 years old. Okay, and uh, why do you not consider surgery for under-18s? So the eye goes through a process of ocular maturity or eye maturity. So as we're growing, the eye actually grows in length and it changes shape, it gets bigger, and, and generally ocular maturity is reached at about 18 years of age. So if we're doing laser vision correction treatments on a 15-year-old or a 16-year-old, we're potentially treating the eye before it has reached full maturity. So as it grows, they could still have uh, further myopia induction, short-sightedness, or hyperopia, and then they're going to need to be retreated at 18 as well. When we look at safety profiles as well of laser vision correction, uh, the younger the person, the less stable that cornea is as well. So we often wait till an age uh, until that cornea is stable, until ocular maturity is reached, until we feel that this eye is safe to operate on. Very interesting is that, you know, we're seeing, just like the uh, corona pandemic, we're seeing, a, if I can call it a pandemic of myopia or short-sightedness in, hmm. in the, the Eastern world especially. Uh, you know, this is largely driven by youngsters being put in front of cell phones and computers yeah. uh, from a very young age and a huge amount of reading from the age of two. Mm. And what this actually does is, is it's forcing the eye to grow in length faster than it should be. And, and that is inducing what we call myopia. So that's why we're seeing so many hundreds of thousands of children in thick glasses by the age of six, seven, eight years old. 
The problem with that is uh, it's not just the myopia. It's the problems that it creates with being myopic or short-sighted. And, and that is a huge spin-off in terms of retina problems, which is the back of the eye. They can thin the retina out too quickly. They can develop little um, lesions where the retina is very weak and fragile and it can tear easily. It can lead to retinal detachments. The area that controls your um, near vision called the macula can develop uh, significant problems if they uh, develop myopia or short-sightedness very quickly. So I think there's a, there's a massive global drive to try and reduce the rate at which myopia is occurring. And we've got many different modalities to use to try and to try and combat this. And that's where optometry is, is fighting the fight here as well. And there's new technologies and contact lenses to try and slow myopic progression down to essentially avoid the real dire, potential dire consequences of myopia down the line. Um, and then, of course, when they're 18, if we can fix that myopia and, and halt it uh, with vision correction, then uh, that's an added, added bonus. Very, very interesting. I also want to ask you, Dr. Joseph, how long should a person wait before they can get uh, checked for all these conditions, including cataracts, uh, and they can, you know, come for an assessment uh, to also look at their suitability for surgery? Yeah. So I think, uh, you know, you know from, from a young age, parents are really um, in tune with their children and, and their vision. And, and it's often the parent that's going to first pick up that there's a problem with a child's uh, tracking with their ball skills, with their depth perception, with their ability to see the blackboard. Teachers may note this as well. And and this is also where optometrists are hugely important. And unfortunately, we've got a lot of optometrists that are involved in the communities and are involved in projects where they screen uh, school-going children uh, to make sure that they um, they haven't got what we call refractive errors. And if they're picked up, that they're treated early. And that's either in the form of spectacles or contact lenses. So, you know, sometimes we see children as, as young as two with a squint and, and, and they need a pair of glasses to correct that or they might need surgery to correct that. There's no age uh, or defined age uh, that you have to wait for, wait until before you actually get assistance. Um, if a parent or the child notes that there's a, a visual problem, vital to get to your optometrist or your ophthalmologist um, to have that checked out. What I say as well when it comes to cataract surgery or vision correction is – um, and I mentioned it last week, the, you know, one doesn't need to wait until there's a, ma a maturity of a cataract before you uh, consider vision correction surgery. My two questions that I put forward to my patients, irrespective of their age, and I'm talking about 18 onwards for surgical approaches, is do you want to improve your vision? Is that going to improve your quality of life? And do you want to reduce your dependence on spectacles and or contact lenses and reading glasses? And if they can answer any of those three, quest or, or three questions or two or tick one box, then they need to look, what's my risk-benefit ratio and what are my options and am I ready for the surgery? So we don't need to wait until they're 65 and they've lost two lines of vision with their cataracts. If they are 45 or 50 and they wear a pair of glasses correcting astigmatism or farsightedness, nearsightedness, and they would like more freedom, then we can look at their options. So I think in summary, if something's picked up early by parents or child, get it seen to. We've got yeah. great optometrists to do that. We've got great ophthalmologists that are in dedicated um, children specialists as well. And um, if you're looking for vision correction, there is no, uh, there is no limit except for under 18s. And uh, also, as you said, uh, those first few years are, are vital because the vision system is still uh, developing. So the sooner you get it checked mm. out, uh, the better. No, I was going to say absolutely. I think, you know, when, when you see a child, um, if they've got something wrong with their visual system, you've got up until seven years of age really to, to try and reverse that as best you can. And that's mm. there's many modalities that you can use to try and correct that. Correct the vision, we can do patching, you can put drops into the eyes to try and penalize the good eye to force the brain to use the, the bad eye. Mm. And, uh, and, the, and the child's brain is so plastic that very often – you can get reversal of that um, poor sight up until about seven. Beyond that, uh, it, it can become a potential problem. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Dr. Joseph, just one last question. Is there a stage where surgery can no longer help? Yeah, so surgery, I think, for cataracts, for refractive errors, can be considered until, you know, your 80s, your 90s. I think where it may no longer help in terms of vision correction 
is where you've got other problems with your visual system. So do you have significant macular problems, so macular degeneration? Do you have really advanced or end-stage glaucoma? Uh, these, are, these are topics that we can discuss in, in future Medical Mondays, and I think are vital because it affects such a huge percentage of our population. And they've got advanced glaucoma, or they've got advanced macular degeneration, or they've had a retinal detachment, and their central visual quality is poor. Then, yes, there's a point to which we have to say, listen, doing cataract surgery may improve a certain amount of your vision, but it's certainly not going to get you to 100% or make you spectacle independent because there are other problems with your visual system. And, and that's the, the vital thing about doing what we call an advanced eye assessment. So whether you're coming in for a cataract evaluation, a customized lens exchange, or, or wanting to look at your general health of your eye, we screen you from the back of the eye right to the front. We go through all of those scans with you. And we show you in detail uh, from front to back what your eye's anatomy looks like, what your problems are, if any, and what can be done or what, uh, what can't be done. Dr. Dylan Joseph, yet again, uh, what an interesting uh, episode of uh, Medical Monday. Thank you so much for your time. How do we get in touch with you? Uh, absolute pleasure again, Ian. Uh, so, yeah, our website is www.dr for Dr. Dylan Joseph.com, D Y L A N J O S E P H.com. Our landline is 044 150 0085, and you can speak to Mariska, and she'll be happy to take the calls and give you any info that you need. And our email address is info at drdillonjoseph.com. And once again, Mariska can help you out there. Fantastic. Uh, looking forward to next uh, week, Monday at 2 o'clock, uh, some more uh, Medical Monday with uh, Dr. Dylan Joseph. Thank you so much, Doc. Until next time. Absolutely. Looking forward, Dion. Have a great week. You too. Cheers. Cheerio.